From 1502 to 1860, 9.9 .9 million Africans were shipped around the world as slaves. Can economics explain this terrible trade? Yes, but only if we look at the whole picture. I went to school in the United States and I learned the US perspective, but the United States only received 7% of these slaves. If we wanna understand the economics of slavery, we need to look at the whole picture. There were two primary drivers of the economics of slavery, and you can summarize those in just one word. I'm gonna cover all that, and I'm going to tell you how studying slavery has changed my perception of economics. There were two principal drivers of where slaves ended up going in the Americas. The first was the marginal value product of labor. Think of this marble as if it was an African leaving for the Americas. It does not roll around randomly. It has some sort of direction. Slaves were bought and sold on an open market. And in markets, money is going to direct where resources are allocated. In the Americas, slaves ended up going to the places where their labor had the highest value. I mentioned this in another video about how the modern US political map mirrors an prehistoric map. I'll put a link to that at the end of this video. A lot of people like to think that ideology drove where slaves went, and that is wrong. A great history, if you're interested in the economic history of slavery in America, is to look at Gavin Wright's book, Slavery and American Economic Development. It's a great book, it's a short read, and he goes through and explains these hypotheses of ideology and how they just don't match what was happening at the time. Many of the colonies in the northern part of what would become the United States were upset that they could not get slaves at prices they wanted. They were being outbid in a competitive market for slaves. Prices drove where slaves went and slaves were incredibly expensive. So who could afford slaves? Pretty much the only people who could buy slaves were the ones farming crops that were valuable enough to justify the price. This brings us to the one word that describes the two driving factors of slavery in America. Sugar. Today, sugar is incredibly prevalent in diets. We have it in our food. We have it in our drink. We even have it in our music. But as late as 1650, sugar almost did not exist in European diets. Sure, there was some sugar being cultivated around the world, but nothing like what we would see in the 1700s and 1800s. We can see the increase in demand by just looking at English diets over this time. In 1650, the average English diet had close to no sugar in it in a year. By 1800s, the average English person was consuming about 30 pounds of sugar a year. And this isn't just sweetening their food, making it taste better, though that's what we usually think of today. This is a way for them to get calories in a world where calories were really hard to come by. It also increases the variety of your foods. You could add sugar to fruit in a jar and you could actually have that fruit out of season, which is funny to me because today, if you go to the supermarket and you look up fruit cups, one of the selling points they'll try to give you is that there are no added sugars. Well, as English diets were consuming more and more sugar, obviously this demand was looking for some way to satisfy it. And that's when sugar production started expanding in the Western hemisphere. Sugar production starts in Brazil in the late 1500s. As they improve those processes, colonization starts spreading to these other territories and sugar cultivation is quick to follow. Sugar production becomes so profitable that sugar plantations can afford slaves. Which brings up the question, why did sugar plantations need slaves? A big hypothesis is productivity. Some people think that slaves were just more productive workers than free labor, but that is not the case. Even though it's wrong, you can see why it might make sense. Slave owners could punish slaves who had low productivity. And we know that monitoring can be an important aspect of productivity. A manager present can make it so people don't slack off as much. That's why now that I'm working a lot from home, I make sure I have manager Pikachu watching over my work so I stay on task. Since I work more when I have a monitor over me, it's easy for me to imagine that I would want to work harder if I knew that I would be whipped for low productivity. The problem with this hypothesis is that we have no evidence that slave labor was more efficient than free labor. One of the problems here is that we rarely see free labor and slave labor working in the same places. Sometimes we see on cotton farms, slave labor and free labor, we can compare their productivity there 
and there's really not much of a difference. But of course, sugar is the main thing, and we don't have evidence that slave labor was more productive than free labor on sugar plantations. So what was the second driver of the slave trade? I got this machete in Haiti, and Haiti used to be the largest sugar producer in the world. Now, one of the reasons I like having this machete is because it reminds me of the second reason for where slaves ended up. They did work nobody else wanted to do. Now, there's a really gruesome way that this machete reminds me of sugar plantations, but let's start with the less horrifying reason first. This machete is like what you would have been using for harvesting sugarcane. You would cut it down, and it just turned out it was really rough work. Now, I imagine taking this out and swinging it around is a little dangerous. You might be worried about cutting your leg, you might be worried about hitting somebody else, and that indeed was the worries that they had. It was not fun work. It's also in areas with really high disease loads where you were more likely to get malaria or you were more likely to just come down with any sort of sickness. In fact, death rates on sugar plantations were substantially higher than they were for any other crop. So yes, working on a sugar plantation was brutal, but that is not the most horrible connection between the machete and the dangerous working conditions. This is a picture of a sugar mill. Obviously, this is not a machete, but after you had used the machete to cut down the sugar cane, you would have brought it to this mill to be processed. Here's a more modern sugar mill to give you an idea of how people process cane. You feed in the cane where the rollers crush it and the cane juice comes out the bottom. Now, I want you to notice something. Look at how carefully these men are feeding the cane into the rollers. The guy who posted this video has another video where he talks about how he got caught in this machine and he has the jacket stuck in the gears to prove it. My coat got hung in the gears. It snatched me right on in. Started screaming for my wife. Surely this is only a problem because this is a gas powered machine, right? There's no way these old mills were able to catch people in them. Here's an account from somebody who lived during those times. If a mill feeder be catched by the finger, his whole body is drawn in and is squeezed to pieces. The problem of getting sucked into the machine brings me to the second reason for the machete. This was such a common problem that sometimes there was an extra slave stationed by them holding a machete ready to cut off the arm of somebody who got stuck in the machine. So not only is working on the plantation incredibly dangerous, working in the mill is dangerous. When you refine the sugar, you boil it, and that was dangerous. Every aspect of this work was incredibly dangerous. That's why initially white indentured labor was working on these sugar plantations. But when they learned that it was incredibly dangerous, Dangerous, they avoided it at all costs. They were able to freely enter into these contracts and they said if that was the kind of work that they were going to do, there was no way they were going to go to those sugar plantations. Because sugar plantations could not get free labor to come work with them, they resorted to slave labor because it was still a valuable crop and nobody else wanted to farm it. So what does this teach us about economics generally? When I think about what I've learned about economics as I've studied slavery, I think about the limits of markets. Now, obviously, I'm a big fan of markets. This is called market power because we believe in the power of markets and economics to shape our world. Yet markets only work in a positive way if people are able to participate of their own free will. Look at what happened with the free labor going to sugar plantations. They could choose whether they went there or not, and they knew that it was not worth the compensation they were receiving. So they didn't go down there. Slaves did not have that choice. These were market participants who weren't freely participating. Coercing people into the market is not a morally good thing. And I think about how economics and markets require more than just prices, supply, demand, the typical economics jargon that we toss around. We also need a moral foundation. And if we don't have a moral foundation behind our economics, we're going to create a world that we do not want. Markets shaped slavery and slavery shapes today's US politics. I recommend you go check out this video that has this crazy connection between a prehistoric map and modern American politics. We'll see you on the next video in Market Power.